Hi everyone and welcome back. In this video we will look at a judges project that we've just finished from a slightly different angle. Before we get started though, I want to congratulate you and I want you to congratulate yourself. We did a great job. Even though Tetris is a seemingly trivial game, programming it has not been so trivial, has it? So I want to give special kudos to those of you who encountered serious issues or got overwhelmed in the process yet decided to persevere instead of giving up. To those of you who got overwhelmed by the complexity of the project and gave up on trying to complete it, there is nothing to be ashamed of. It's never too late to try again and what you're about to hear in this video might help you find motivation to do so. And to those of you who haven't even heard about the Tetris project, you might still find this video useful, even though the main purpose of this video is to conclude the video series. It might as well serve as an introduction to the series. There is one more thing I'd like to emphasize before we get started. The main goal of this channel is not to show you how to make computer programs, but to help you learn how to do that on your own. To be honest, I don't really want you to know how to make a Tetris game, yet I do want you to learn how to make something way more exciting than that. With that said, let's summarize what we did to make the Tetris game by looking at the main components of the program. We have a game area class that is represented, among other things, by an array of color arrays named background. The game area class contains five methods responsible for moving a Tetris block. The game area class is also responsible for spawning blocks, moving them to background when they stop falling, and clearing complete lines. Not all methods and variables of the game area class are listed here, but this should give us a general idea as to what the game area class is. The game area class is also responsible for instantiating Tetris block classes at runtime. Each Tetris block object has a shape represented by an array of interrays, color, position, and rotation. In addition to this, we have game form class that extends JFrame and serves as the main form of our game. The game form class is responsible for instantiating the game area class and the game thread class. The game thread class in turn is responsible for repeatedly calling some methods of the game area class. The game form class also calls some methods of the game area class, but unlike the game thread class, the game form class doesn't do that at regular time intervals, but on key press. In other words, the game form class is responsible for taking user input. This diagram doesn't show some other classes that we have in our project, but it illustrates the main functionality of the program. Some of you might remember that in one of the first videos of this video series, I said that a program designed with object-oriented approach in mind can be viewed as a bunch of objects interacting with one another. On the screen, you see four objects represented by rectangles, and their interactions are represented by arrows. Some of you have probably figured that a diagram on the screen is not really related to programming. What you see on the screen is a simplified example of software design. And normally for a relatively large project, we should first design it and only then move on to programming or implementing it. Makes sense, right? Before we act, we should plan first. But wait a second, some of you might say, we didn't design the Tetris program before we started programming it. What the heck? Why did we not do the design part together in this tutorial? Well, simply because if you are new to programming, designing the program would just bore you to death. Then why did I bring this up at the very end? A bit too late to design a program we've already made, isn't it? I'm bringing this up now when to let you know that there is an important step in programming or rather software development in general, and two, to expand my favorite mantra a bit. So here we go. Since the only thing computers do is data processing, when writing a program, we should think when, what data we need, and two, how that data must be processed. But when designing a program using the object-oriented approach, we should think when, what classes we need, and two, how those classes must interact. Sounds pretty simple, eh? I'm not really trying to deceive you by the simplicity though. Programming and software design are not easy. Just like anything worthwhile, learning programming requires effort, and that must be consistent and honest. With all that said, let's talk a bit more about object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming, or OOP, is an approach to making computer programs based on using objects. An OOP object is just a form of data, similar to numbers, text, and other stuff that we talked about on this channel earlier. What makes objects somewhat special is that they can contain other pieces of data, including other objects, pretty much like food dishes can consist of various ingredients. Following this analogy, to make a dish, in addition to ingredients, we need a recipe. In OOP, classes are the recipes. When we write code, we essentially write a recipe. And when we instantiate a class, we give that recipe to the computer and have it use that recipe to create the dish. 
using various kinds of data as ingredients. And we can use one recipe to create as many dishes as we want, given that we have enough ingredients. This is a loose analogy, but it might help you understand the relationship between classes and objects a bit better. Some of you might say, why object-oriented programming? What's so special about it anyways? Isn't it yet another thing to make my life as a programming learner harder? Well, actually, no. The idea of OOP is just the opposite. Make your life as a programmer easier. How? Objects are meant to make it easier to handle data. Remember at first we had an array of int arrays in the game area class, which represented a Tetris block. And later we created a separate class to do the job. We did this to make it somewhat more convenient to deal with blocks. Instead of creating a separate class for the Tetris block, we could have continued adding more variables and methods to the game area class, bloating it out like this. The game area class already has a lot of code, and adding even more will make it even harder for us to make sense of that code. So, instead of having one monstrous class, we split it up into smaller classes. Divide and conquer works well even in programming, or rather especially in programming. Okay, okay, I get it. OP is cool, I guess. But what do I need to do to learn it? My answer to this question is not really sexy, unfortunately. You need to get absolutely familiar with the basics first. What I mean by being familiar with basics is not being able to write a for loop or an if statement. Being familiar with basics means being able to solve problems using for loops and if statements. For example, if you need to have your program draw a grid, like we did in the first video of the Tetris series, you should be able to reformulate the task into calling a method inside a nested loop with a number of iterations for each loop depending on the dimensions of the grid. Um, are you serious? That doesn't sound like a piece of cake for a total beginner, like, at all. How am I supposed to learn that? The answer is pretty straightforward, yet not really sexy either. Practice. Hours of focused and consistent practice to be precise. But practice doesn't mean that you memorize the code. You shouldn't. It won't be much help. Programming is a skill, pretty much like riding a bicycle. Memorizing how to ride a bicycle doesn't mean that you can actually do it. Programming is not about writing code per se. It's first and foremost about solving problems and translating those solutions into a language that computers understand. For example, making a Tetris block fall down is a problem that we need to solve to create a Tetris program. The solution to this problem that we used in this video series is to have the computer draw a Tetris block at different vertical positions in the game area, and do that at regular time intervals. How do we translate this solution into a programming language? Well, Java in our case. We introduce a piece of data that represents the position of the block in the game area. We add a method that modifies a piece of data. And we call that method at regular time intervals by using a separate thread. And we make sure that the block gets repainted at the new position by calling another method. The thing is, if you just memorize this code, it's unlikely that you will be able to apply a similar solution to a similar problem. You can memorize that to send a letter to your friend, you need to go to the post office. But if you don't understand the overall purpose of the postal service, you might not be able to figure out that you can go to the same post office when you want to send a gift to that same friend. So only understanding the logic of a program and understanding how that logic translates into code enables you to write your own programs independently. Sounds harsh? I wish I knew how to learn new things easier. But there's good news too. I'm pretty sure that if you sit right next to me and reproduce the Tetris program on your own without any assistance and without memorizing it, you won't have serious difficulty creating more complex programs on your own. And I don't mean to say that there is something magical about this Tetris program. Not at all. What enables you to create complex programs on your own is the way most of programming is done nowadays. There is a ton of ready solutions out there, solutions that you can use as building blocks for your projects. Yes, you can and in fact should use other people's code, given that you do that legally, of course. But without understanding programming, it won't be easy for you to do that. For example, remember the JTable class that we used to display the leaderboard? Remember how user-unfriendly it is? This is just one of the potential infinite examples of how using other people's solutions might be nearly impossible without proper understanding of programming. In addition, without understanding programming, it won't be easy for you to make sense of what some knowledgeable folks write on, say, Stack Overflow or Reddit. And the Tetris project that we've made is designed to help you develop that understanding. 
enabling you to tap into the bank of existing programming solutions, technologies, and techniques. Well, to be fair, it doesn't have to be this Tetris project. You can choose anything that seems appealing to you and use it as your learning material. It is important, though, that you have interest in the project you use for studying. Otherwise, it might be too much of suffering. But if you're interested in the project, you will naturally try to tinker with it, alter it, improve it, which will only facilitate your learning. So again, if you want to be able to make cool programs, you need to learn the basics first. Everything else is Googleable. Now, what do I mean by basics? It's data types and variables, methods, conditional statements, loops, classes and objects. And this is pretty much it. See, even though Tetris is more complex than anything we did on this channel before, if you look closely, you will see that it's the same old variables. If statements, loops, and methods. Speaking of the devil, there's a couple things about methods that I'd like to mention. We created and called a lot of methods, and just like with classes, splitting up the functionality into separate methods that interact with one another is a good way to make your entire code easier to understand and manage. As a beginner, you might feel tempted to write the entire program in a single method, which has a bunch of disadvantages. For one, debugging a method that contains a few hundred lines of code might turn into a nightmare. So writing methods is something you should become super familiar with. Calling methods is another thing that you should be able to do with your eyes closed. M not literally, of course. There is one thing about calling methods that to some people might seem obvious and to some a bit less so. Let's look at the game area class instantiation where we pass the game area constructor to parameters. What's important here is that methods do not care about variable names that you pass them as parameters. All they care about is the data type of the parameters and their order. So the game area constructor takes two parameters. The first one is of type jpanel, and the second one is of type int. In the gameform class, we instantiate the game area class, and as the first parameter, we pass the game area constructor the variable named game area placeholder. But when we declare the constructor, we name the jpanel parameter just placeholder. Why does it work? Because again, methods don't care about names, only the data types and the order of the parameters. And since game area placeholder is of type jpanel, the game area constructor accepts it without complaints. The second parameter of the game area constructor is an int named columns. And in the game form, we pass it 10. And it works even though 10 is not even a variable and doesn't have a name. And it works because 10 is a valid int. So again, methods do not care about the names of variables passed to them as parameters. They only care about the data type and the order of the parameters. And in this case, the first parameter must be of the type jpanel, while the second parameter must be of the type int. There is one more thing I'd like to mention before we wrap up this video. Some say that laziness promotes innovation, that people end up inventing stuff because they're just too lazy to do things by themselves. A good programmer is a lazy one. Well, that depends on how you look at it. Let me show you an example. Here, in the Tetris block class, we created a separate method that automatically creates four 90-degree rotations for the array of interrays that represents the shape of a Tetris block. The main part of this method is this single line of code, which to some or even most of you might seem like a total rocket science, especially if you don't like math. Now, we could have taken an easier and more straightforward approach. Since each Tetris block has only four 90-degree rotations, and the Tetris game has only seven block types, it's 28 rotations in total, some of which are not unique, meaning we could have hard-coded the shape arrays for each of the 28 rotations. Something like this. Not a big deal, right? Then why did we not do that? Because hard coding doesn't really help you develop your problem solving skills. Some people say that lazy programmers prefer universal solutions to hard coding because hard coding is just too much work. I personally think it's the opposite. Hard coding instead of a more universal and potentially reusable solution is the choice of a lazy programmer because quite often hard coding is just easier. So the bottom line, if you want to learn programming, Avoid hard coding as much as possible. Don't be lazy.
Even though some people say that a good programmer is a lazy one. Okay, okay, I get it. To be able to code, I need to learn a bunch of stuff, but how do I learn that stuff? I mean, how do you learn efficiently? Well, that we will talk about in the next video. <laughs> no, no, I'm not trolling you or anything. In the next video, we'll give you a few tips that might help you learn more effectively and efficiently. The tips we're going to present come from our own experience as learners and educators, and I'm looking forward to being able to share them with you. So stay tuned and see you soon. Bye-bye.